Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show where in this video we're going to talk about 5 c what we know about it, how we think it's acting and take a look at some of the clinical trials that are currently being conducted using 5 c looking at both the dose and bioavailability. And then lastly I'll give my verdict. So first then, what is 5 c Well, 5 c is a naturally occurring flavonoid. Here is its structure. And you've most likely eaten 5 c because it's found in apples, grapes, onions, cucumbers, and has the highest amount in strawberries. These amounts are still quite low though, and the average daily intake of naturally occurring physetin is estimated to be around 0.4 milligrams per day. So physetin is a polyphenol then, similarly to resveratrol and quercetin. In fact, the chemical structure of physetin is very similar to quercetin, differing only in a hydroxyl group in position 5. And it's important that you remember that because we'll be coming back to both physetin and quercetin later on in this video. But for now, we're going to go back in time, back to a Nature publication that was published in 2003 that identified activators of a protein known as CERT1. Background to this research is nicely explained in David Sinclair's book Lifespan, they had recently identified that extra copies of the yeast equivalent of SIRT1, SIRT2, extended their lifespan, and so were interested in identifying compounds that could activate this protein. This would enable them to increase the activity of SIRT2 without having to add additional copies of the gene. At the same time, Conrad Howitz was trying to identify inhibitors of SIRT1, the human equivalent, because having inhibitors to different enzymes helps researchers to try and understand what these different proteins are doing. Moreover, it's more common to identify compounds that can inhibit a protein as opposed to activate it. So excitingly, in his research, he identified two chemicals that actually activated SIRT1 activity. The first one was physetin. And as we saw earlier that physetin is chemically similar to quercetin, physetin is also quite similar to the polyphenol resveratrol, and so in this nature study, they effectively end up showing that resveratrol is superior to physetin in terms of activating SIRT1. But this is just the beginning of our understanding of physetin, as physetin, like other polyphenols, seem to have a variety of different functions within a cell, and it's not necessarily clear what their precise targets are, or how many targets they have within a cell. And so more recent work suggests that physetin may have senolytic properties. So what are senolytics? Well, senolytics are a class of drugs that selectively clear senescent cells. Now, you've likely heard senescent cells be described as zombie cells, but effectively senescent cells are cells that have entered a state of cell cycle arrest, that is, they've stopped dividing, and instead, they often seem to be secreting this inflammatory phenotype, referred to as the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. Whilst it's initially thought that these inflammatory factors can help to bring in immune cells to get rid of these senescent cells, their accumulation can occur during aging and result in this chronic inflammation that can cause a variety of age-associated diseases. You can see a list of these different diseases here. It's pretty exhaustive. And so the hope is that senolytics that selectively kill these senescent cells may be able to provide therapeutic benefits to people with these different diseases. And also, given that cellular senescence is a hallmark of ageing, it's also potentially thought that senolytics could be useful to help extend health span or even lifespan. And so the word that I keep emphasising is selective. And so the idea is that you want these senolytics to target senescent cells and not your healthy normal cells. And the second thing is that our understanding of senolytics is that instead of them targeting one specific protein or molecule within the cell, it seems to be targeting senescent cells, as in it seems to be targeting a senescent network that gets perturbed on the addition of senolytics and causes it to die. And so this brings us back to physetin, where its senolytic potential was further tested. In this 2018 paper, physetin is a senotherapeutic that extends health span and lifespan. And so the first thing they did in the study was to compare the effects of physetin to other flavonoids in terms of its senotherapeutic effects in cells induced into senescence by oxidative stress. And so they used the kind of more vague term senotherapeutic, as in this initial part, they were just trying to look at how the number of senescent cells varied on addition of these different flavonoids. And so if you look in the figure here, you can see that physetin, compared to their control, greatly reduced the number of senescent cells present, and so therefore supporting the senotherapeutic potential of physetin. It's interesting to note though that quercetin didn't. 
And so two kind of main points come from this. Firstly, it's the understanding that senescent cells can be induced in a variety of different ways. And senescent cells are very different. It depends on their context, how they were induced, it depends on their cell type. And so different potential cellulitics may be targeting different sets of senescent cells. And then secondly, often if you look at studies, for example, this study I mentioned before, where it was an Alzheimer's disease model, where they looked at removing senescent cells here, They used a combination of quercetin and disatinib. And so obviously they just had quercetin alone here. So maybe it isn't surprising that alone quercetin didn't have as great an impact on the reduction of senescent cells as fisetin. But it's crazy how similar those structures are, yet the results are so different here. But anyway, these are in vitro models. In the study, they also did a variety of in vivo tests. The first one that I want to mention here is in a prodroid mouse model that also possesses a reporter that enables you to detect cells that have high expression of P16, P16 being a gene that's commonly upregulated in senescence. And so in these mice, they can effectively use this reporter to identify senescent cells. And so in this figure here, you can see quite strikingly that the addition of physetin, which they only gave to the mice intermittently, so they gave them from weeks 6 to 8 and 12 to weeks of age, Um, this being a prodroid mouse model, so they age faster than normal mice. And even with this intermittent treatment, whereby they were given fisetin in their chow diet, so they were having roughly 60 milligrams per kilogram fisetin per day during these time periods. And at 12 weeks, you can see quite a striking difference in the luminescence levels, which is how they detect P16 expressing cells. And so this seems to be suggesting fisetin's senolytic potential, And moreover, in this graph, you can see that consistently throughout these different weeks, the number of senescent cells detected by the luminescence is always lower in the physetin diet compared to the control diet. And so the thing that they also point out in this paper is that even in the weeks where they weren't getting any physetin, you still see a significant difference between the control and the physetin diet, suggesting that intermittent treatment may be effective as a so-called hit and run, whereby you can have short bursts of physetin treatment to get rid of senescent cells and then do it again once more have accumulated. And this comes down to the kinetics of the fact that physetin seems to have pretty much an immediate impact on the senescent cells, whereas senescent cells can take much longer weeks to months to accumulate. And the other interesting thing they did in the study is that they gave physetin in their diet to aged mice beginning at 85 weeks of age. So in human terms, I mean, it's always hard to try and translate, but it's roughly 75 years in humans. And so they gave this to 85 week old mice, and you can see that it seemed to extend the lifespan of these mice. And they also did a couple of measurements to look at their health span, albeit it's not the best set of measurements. But they did show that physetin reduced oxidative stress in the liver of the old mice. And if you want a more extensive look at this research paper, then you should check out Life Extensions Advocacy Foundation's journal club where they do discuss this paper. But the last bit of data I want to show you is when they looked at how physetin impacted human adipose tissue, whereby they treated these tissue explants with 20 micromolar of physetin for 48 hours. And so this tissue typically contains senescent cells. And you can see here that it caused a significant reduction in these inflammatory markers of the senescence secretory phenotype, including interleukin-6 and interleukin-8. But it also suggests that there could be some translational potential of physetin to humans. And so this now brings us on to clinical trials that are currently being conducted using physetin in different human diseases. And so one of these trials is being conducted by James Kirkland's team at the Mayo Clinic, with the title Alleviation by Physetin of Frailty, Inflammation and Related Measures in Older Adults, where physetin will be administered orally in doses up to 20 mg per kilogram for each patient. And they're also looking at just an acute treatment with physetin, giving them orally for only two consecutive days. And so I also said at the beginning, at some point I'd come back to the bioavailability of physetin. And so physetin is a hydrophobic molecule. That means it's effectively terrified, scared of water. Basically, it doesn't want to associate mix with water. And so dissolving in water is pretty hard for something like physetin, whereas polar solvents like oil are favourable. And so it doesn't really say in this study how they're actually delivering it. And so in addition to its low bioavailability in water, physetin is also quite rapidly metabolised. And so I don't know how that's going to impact the study, but I guess there are also things they'll probably be trying to look at in these sorts of studies. But there's another clinical trial in the work that's also using the same amount of physetin, this time trying to improve skeletal health for older humans. 
And there's also another clinical trial that's trying to look at osteoarthritis and whether physocin can alleviate those symptoms, which will be interesting given the failure of UBX-101. Anyway, the other thing that's worth mentioning is, is that there's also a clinical trial to use physocin for older hospitalised COVID-19 patients to prevent progression to cytokine storm and acute respiratory distress syndrome. And so that got FDA approval recently. And the motivation for the study came from previous data that seems to be unpublished, where physocin reduced mortality in mice infected with mouse beta coronavirus. And so there's a lot of potential for physetin, but it's impossible to know if physetin treatment will be beneficial or harmful without some of this data coming out. And it's hard to say if that data will even give us these answers, given the fact that they seem to be doing acute doses of physetin. But maybe acute is all you need. I guess we'll just have to wait and find out. And so this is in line with James Kirkland, who's behind the majority of these different trials, that says, until such studies are done, it is too early for senolytics to be used outside of clinical trials. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But in this quite extensive article that I recommend you read if you're interested in fisetin, showed that giving mice really high amounts of fisetin or giving the mice fisetin in their diets for nine months didn't seem to show any toxicity. And so that does give some hope that Phytosin could be safe. I mean, it's also a natural product found in foods. But again, we won't know for certain until the trial data comes out. So with that, I just have to give a shout out to my Patreon, Tina. Woo! And hope you've learned something in this video. And as always, thanks for listening.